welcome to the Zapiens Podcast. I'm your host, Lloyd Waits. I'm a particle physics student at MIT working in machine learning and nuclear medicine. Today, I'll be interviewing Professor Dablina Sakhar from the MIT Media Lab. She's been doing a lot of interesting work in low-power electronics that have the capability to revolutionize computer science and electrical engineering. Most recently, this work has been also introduced into neuroscience and biotechnology. Today, we're going to be talking about some of the interesting applications of this work, as well as how the specifics of this technology works. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, so thank you for sitting down to talk with us today. Um, I know you've done a lot of interesting work in neurointerfaces and low temperature electronics, um, but for new people, can you kind of su quickly summarize some of what you've done and what you're planning on doing and some of the interesting applications for it? Yeah, sure. Uh, so actually, I started my career as a nanoelectronics researcher, and I was developing uh, low-power nanoelectronic devices. So right now, we have this problem that our computers, they take up too much energy. So if you want to make them more efficient, they would just burn up the whole thing. So the devices that I was developing, mainly during my PhD period, was really to solve this problem. And we are using quantum mechanical devices, tunnel field effect transistors, uh, which can help us to solve this problem and using like novel materials, uh, which are atomically thin materials, some of them. And uh, so during my PhD, while I was working on these low power electronic devices, I also got interested in other non-electronic computational systems, especially the brain, because the brain can be thought of as the lowest power computer. So that got me interested in uh, neuroscience, and for my postdoctoral research, I actually completely switched my field from nanoelectronics to neuroscience. So, and uh, for my postdoctoral research, what I did was I uh, developed a technology which helps us to look at the biomolecular building blocks of the brain and to look at them at high re resolution. And we found that we can see structures and nanoarchitecture in the brain which was actually invisible when you see with other technologies, and we made some uh, fascinating discoveries there. So we found that biomolecules in the brain are arranged uh, like in a very nanoscale and nanoscale precision, and uh, and that actually allows us to comp like allows the brain to compute in a much more efficient way than um, uh, it is that would, would, it would have been otherwise possible. So it's interesting that, you know, as nanoelectronics researcher, we think of nanoscale precision and, uh, you know, nanofab and all those uh, excellent tools that you have devised. But it was just fascinating to know that in our brain, Mother Nature has actually developed, uh, you know, this kind of amazing, you know, architecture. And the precise, the, the, you know, there's a resolution at which the molecules are aligned are not even micron scale, they're nanoscale in nature, uh, which is just like, uh, like mind blowing. So in my own group, what I'm doing is uh, kind of fusing these two fields together, uh, nanoelectronics and applied physics for biology. So there are two main research directions. Um, uh, one is to uh, still continue to push forward the boundaries of low power computing, have uh, very energy efficient electronic devices for computing purposes but also to fuse these electronic devices with our biological systems and that can uh, help us to develop novel therapeutics and uh, to understand our body and specifically the brain better, but also down the line, but that might be more futuristic to e even, you know, augment ourselves. And uh, so, I um, mean, if we want to go into more details of um, uh, what you are doing specifically. So right now, um, wherever we are in terms of uh, nanoelectronic devices or bioelectronic interfaces, we'll see that a um, major problem uh, there is these devices are just too large. And when you put inside our body or specifically inside the brain, they're just very invasive. And apart from the invasiveness, uh, they do not have, um, say, cellular precision that is required, specifically when you want to make these devices wireless so that you can remotely control them. Those devices are huge. But our bodies, you know, if you think of a building, it's 
made of bricks and all the bricks are more or less similar but uh, cells that our body is made up of they have like humongous heterogeneity and they're like so many so much uh, diversity there so just taking an average effect of all those cells is not good enough um so uh, so a very large device which just measures an average effect of many cells or which is able to record from you know many cells the average effect uh, will not going to help us understand biology so we need devices which can record and modulate at a single cell level so we are actually developing extremely small miniaturized nano electronic devices which can be subcellular in size and they can either sit on top of the cell or they can even go inside the cell if you want to do intracellular analysis or if we are even making devices which are transcellular uh, means some part is inside some part is outside so it can interact with both extracellular and intracellular uh, um, environment and the idea is to have those devices do three things like uh, read in information uh, then also write and uh, like read out information and then um, uh, also write in information into the biological system and uh, modulation or write uh, so writing information can be for say therapeutic purposes but as i said down the line we want to transcend biology and uh, you know like enhance ourselves so that's kind of a future goal so kind of continuing down that line before i start getting into some of the more technical questions um what would be the ultimate vision of this project? Like, say, I just got a call from an anonymous donor, and he said, I will give you as much money as you need to bring this project and these, these series of projects to full uh, kind of conceptualization. What would that look like? What would that kind of ultimate vision look like? Oh, ultimate vision would be like if we are, we are in kind of this utopia, right? We have, like, money to do everything and no mm -hmm. questions asked, do everything, uh, I think the first thing would uh, still be to, you know, develop devices that can uh, therapeutically, you know, change our systems. Uh, for example, right now, even in the most common of, uh, you know, neurological diseases, if you talk of depression, Parkinson's, you know, Alzheimer's, um, first of all, you know very less about those diseases or the, about the brain to, um, uh, you know, uh, make informative changes. And second is we do not have systems, even if we know that some therapeutics work, we do not have a way to um, bring in those therapeutics in an effective way. And so, you know, the aim would be to develop basically extremely miniaturized nanoelectronic devices. And uh, so and you incorporate this functionality um, inside them so that uh, you know you will be able to read in information and have a feedback um, circuitry so that you can also write in information at the same time to modulate for therapeutics i think that's that will still be the um, you know uh, goal for next several i would say decades before we really think about uh, you know augmentation but if we think of a really long term goal and if we are thinking that you have solved all those neurological diseases and uh, <laughs> <laughs> we have got the world <laughs> rid of all the diseases, yeah. yeah, then, you know, then, then, you know, think of healthy humans and, uh, you know, why not transcend biology? Okay. So typically when uh, we have talks about uh, brain machine interfaces, it's a lot of talk about electrical stimulation. Um, but neurons tend to communicate in ways beyond that as well, right? Like extracellular vesicles and uh, electrochemical signals. Um, would this type of system be able to adapt to doing uh, those other types of stimulations and communications as well, in addition to just something like electrical stimulation? Yeah, that is the goal. So some of the devices uh, we are uh, developing, um, yeah, they do electrical stimulation, uh, but the idea is also to have still use electronics, uh, but to have a system, you can think of it as, uh, you know, a basket with lid, and in that basket, it will have, say, some neurochemicals uh, or drugs that are stored, and then you can send in electronic signals, and the electronic circuits analyzes when is the need to use those kind of uh, chemicals, and as a function of it. So the, there is still computation going on, and that's something is done by the electronic chip, 
but then the modulation the final thing is happening through this uh, biochemical release and this release is controlled uh, by your the electronic circuit so that those kind of systems can also be integrated so you can go beyond say just electronic stimulation so it, it sounds like there's a lot of different sensors that are going to be need in, needed in a system like this. I mean, not only do you have a voltmeter, which typically when I think of a voltmeter is about this big and it's used by an electrician, um, but you also need to have a lot of chemical sensors and, and things like that as well. Um, so how would you, uh, I know this is kind of the topic of your research, but how do you ensure that all of this is able to be fit into such a small package to be able to be integrated into a subcellular piece of machinery? Yeah. So yeah, scaling down is a major challenge in electronics, not only for neural interfacing, but also for uh, this whole field of information technology. As you might be knowing, like we always hear about Moore's law is coming to an end. We are no, no longer able to scale electronics um, the way we would have loved to be. So we'll have to go beyond you know, conventional electronics uh, right now. Uh, so in terms of uh, not only going to materials beyond silicon, so silicon has a rule for decades, but it's time to you know say goodbye and look to look into other uh, meta materials which have like excellent properties. In terms of device physics, also we'll have to think beyond the conventional way in which electronics works, uh, which is um, you know which involves Boltzmann's transport and. Um, uh, and things like those, uh, so we can borrow ideas from uh, quantum mechanics and uh, use uh, this uh, kind of novel, novel materials uh, like, uh, say, what do we um, use, uh, like atomic or lithium materials, which have excellent electron, like uh, electrostatic uh, properties, but also uh, they have uh, certain characteristics which we don't see in other conventional 3D materials, and that really helps us to you know engage uh, novel physics so we can make devices which we call like beyond moves devices so they can help us to scale down the electronics part of it um, uh, to a point which a conventional silicon electronics for today cannot do so that is absolutely necessary unconventional thinking um, and uh, bringing in novel device ideas uh, that would be for the electronics part, but if we think of, uh, like, if we want to, say, do biochemical um, kind of analysis, we'll probably have to inject some amount, some concentration of uh, those biochemicals. So how they will be stored, that will take some area. So right now we're still focusing on electrical stimulation to start with. Um, uh, but if we figure out, so of course, as I said, it would be a basket with a lid. And then uh, if we if it turns out that you know we'll have to inject a certain amount of uh, say biochemist um, whatever reagents that you have to inject a drug uh, to affect that neuron, the one way to reduce it would be to have a very localized effect. So if we can send our devices and concentrate into a region where it has most effect instead of uh, you know using things up or just uh, losing them out uh, instead of uh, like losing them to diffusion. So if you want to say affect the synapses, can we um, target these devices at the synaptic regions? So when the biochemicals are released, um, so they are able to affect it more. And that's something we can learn from biology and brain itself. So one of those things that I was saying that we found that these biomolecules are not just randomly oriented, they are actually oriented in nanoscale precision such that one is just on top of another. And uh, that actually allows um, uh, the brain and that's so that, that when I mean, the neurotransmitter is released, so since they're just aligned on top of each other, it just has to go like the shortest distance possible. Because if they're just randomly oriented, there is more possibility of them getting you know, diffused and uh, lost in the way. So I think by very uh, localized targeting, we'll be able to also reduce the amount of biochemicals which we have to inject. Similarly, for electrical stimulation, there are regions in the um, uh, like in the axon where you stimulate the effect is the most, like axon hillock. So that way you can reduce the power. So there would be a lot of you know new thinking and novel device and applied physics that needs to come in for achieving such miniaturization. Okay, 
So how would you intend on getting these devices into individual neurons or individual cells? Is this something that would be like an open cut surgery or would this be some kind of, would it be kind of more like nuclear medicine where you have it attached to a ligand or an antibody or something along those lines? Yeah, one thing we are exploring and we are very excited about is um, this idea of circulatronics that you are exploring, that you will be able to send nanoelectronic devices without doing any surgery at all. So right now, um, whenever we think of you know, implanting a device, basically you think of you know an invasive surgery, cutting through the flesh and bone, and which is always um, you know associated with some kind of pain. Is not also not possible for you know uh, different people who may may not be uh, you know who may not be suitable for undergoing uh, surgeries. Um, but just this idea of you know drilling a hole through the brain and <laughs> putting an electrode in uh, is not very nice to start with, even if someone can uh, have that done. Uh, so one um, uh, one uh, you know project direction that we are uh, exploring. Anyway, this is not published. I may not be able to tell uh, in much details. But uh, what we are doing, we are developing devices um, uh, which uh, you do not have to uh, implant uh, by drilling a hole through the skull. There are ways, like either you take a pill or it can be through a nasal inhalation. Uh, these devices uh, will be introduced into our circulatory system and it will use the natural pathways of the body and uh, we have uh, ways to also functionalize them so that they can be targeted to a region of interest and we have some initial results in uh, like mice that we work in animal models to start with that they can actually cross the blood brain barrier and uh, and you know go to that targeted region so this is one aspect of research that you are super excited about yeah. yeah so i don't know if you can tell me this but how does that work i mean i know with uh, similar systems it's attached to some kind of protein um, that then is then able to either attack a tumor or an individual cell in order to do things like a PET scan. Um, it, would this be attached to a protein or would this be something completely different? Yeah I, yeah, I may not be able to tell you the exact thing. The only thing I can tell you it has some functionalization uh, which does uh, three things. One, um, it kind of a voice or it, it is camouflaged in such a way that the body thinks of it as its own uh, you know biological system so it is not attacked by other cells which generally if they see any foreign body they engulf it, engulf it and you know uh, try to remove it uh, from the body through excretion so that's one thing and uh, and it also the second thing is uh, increases increasing the circulation time so that if the circulation time through the body is increased, then there is more probability that we can tar can go to the targeted region. And third thing is um, uh, the devices, uh, the way they are designed, they can also you know cross the blood-brain barrier, which is a major problem. So even if we uh, develop drugs um, which can go to other parts of the body, they do not necessarily cross the blood-brain barrier uh, and go inside the brain tissue. Uh, so these are the three things that it can uh, do. But we are, um, hopefully, will be able to, you know, publish this soon and bring it to the, you know, public domain for further discussion. So uh, you mentioned doing inhalation and or swallowing a pill, um, but I feel like those are all ways to just kind of get it into the bloodstream. Mm -hmm. um, is there a reason you didn't directly mention just directly injecting it into the bloodstream? Does it have to go through certain channels? No, that oh, is also okay. absolutely fine. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. Okay. Um, so another question I wanted to ask was, say all the biological problems are solved um, and you're able to get these very small pieces into the brain with multiple sensors, how are you going to be able to make sure that these have enough power? Because, I mean, there's... A lithium ion battery is pretty large in order to get any kind of power. There's some things with uh, inductive powering, I know, where there's like a magnet on the outside of a, of a subject. Um, but how would the best way to make sure that these continue to function and continue to function with a low failure rate and maintaining power all at the same time? Yeah, I think power harvesting is one of the major challenges. 
So I think there are two ways that we are, uh, you know, kind of uh, um, uh, trying to resolve this issue. One is making the nanoelectronics itself extremely, extremely low power so that, uh, you know, it will need power and we need to provide some external source, but uh, also whatever source we have, it will always have some attenuation uh, in the brain tissue and scattering. So, and there is always a maximum limit because of the heating issue, uh, heating issue of the, you know, the brain. So you cannot shove in a lot of power itself. Uh, so that's one. And second, we are, um, we had been exploring different ways. The ideal way would be if we could harvest the energy from the body itself, right? Um, uh, it's from, you know, there are different vibrations in the body that's available. There are different biochemical reactions that are happening. There are all solutions. Uh, yeah, what we figured out is from the scale of the devices that um, we are exploring, uh, that energy is, you know, insufficient. Uh, maybe for large scale devices, it would be fine. But when we think of subcellular devices, um, because the surface area is so low, uh, at least for now, uh, uh, so we have uh, decided to focus on harvesting external energy. We are using uh, electromagnetic waves at um, different, um, you know, frequencies. And what we have found is that uh, even with uh, electromagnetic waves, which would otherwise be insufficient to, uh, say, uh, um, for powering up devices deep inside um, a brain, um, and and you're thinking of devices uh, which can be powered through the skull, so you do not have to even get rid of the skull. But when you make these devices extremely low power, we are able to, you know, power our devices, uh, so external electromagnetic fields. And the idea would be, uh, so we are still doing all the experiments uh, with like animal models right now, so we use mice. Um, but the idea would be down the line, say, um, uh, if we are to think of translating it to human beings, uh, so someone wearing a kind of hairband kind of thing, and uh, then the transmitter is there, and um, and it should not be like too heavy or cumbersome. So the, again, the low bar helps in there, and the devices would be wireless, and they will be implanted inside, and there would be no like protruding electrodes because we we are we don't again want a hole in the skull. Yeah. That, that's that's interesting so uh, kind of like a, a spin of inductive uh, charging by using just straight up uh, EM waves so eventually because especially because a lot of these I'm assuming these will be kind of mass produced and put into multiple cells across the body um, I would assume that they're going to have some amount of failure rate or over time they're not going to be able to continue on how can you make sure that these uh, individual pieces will be actually excreted from the body or will leave the cell when they're no longer functioning and kind of in the same vein, make sure that they're not sent out too early so that you don't end up losing the effectiveness of the actual interface? Yeah, actually that we can um, uh, learn from our material scientist friends. Mm -hmm. So there have been a lot of materials. First of all, we have to make these devices biocompatible. And uh, second, uh, there can be like two types of devices. One, which is for more chronic implantation, where we want the device to stay, for example, for the whole life period of the person, because probably would need to, uh, you know, either record or uh, provide the therapeutics uh, for things which goes on for the whole lifetime. That's one. But second, uh, for some cases, we might want that, you know, the devices should just work for, it could be like maybe for, till one week to say like three years. But then after that, that is not required anymore. And uh, there are different kinds of materials that um, uh, that are available, uh, which, which just, you know, decay over time. And it's like called transient electronics, uh, not something that we have explored in uh, great details. But the idea that we have is that once we make these devices, you know, subcellular size devices, and uh, this whole idea and this whole design can also be implemented with those kind of material systems. And by choosing these proper materials, we'll be able to, you know, tune the time period of activity, whether it will, we need to make it to work for one week or one day or one year or permanent. Um, so 
Say you have a permanent system or even a semi-permanent system. There's going to be a very large amount of data coming out of all of these individual pieces. Um, do you have a plan on how best to process that data um, or kind of how it would even be multiplexed to kind of get a useful amount of information out? Yeah, so that is a huge problem, the multiplex. Like uh, if we have, say, uh, even if we have a technology in, in terms of the nanoelectronic devices that you are able to send non-invasively and it goes on to each and every neuron, uh, the amount of data that it will produce, if it's, say, if you are recording data at the rate of, say, in kilohertz, or if you want to get a subthreshold region or more details, we'll have to probably make the speed faster. And all these devices will produce data that will have to be, you know, recorded in an external system at an extremely high rate. And we calculated that that rate is actually not possible uh, <laughs> with the <laughs> uh, current system that we have. Um, uh, and uh, so our, at least we are not uh, actually, our research is not focused on developing that part of the problem yet. Uh, but I would think that, you know, the uh, scientists who are working in that region really have to, you know, boost up their work um, uh, to keep up with other technologies that we will be developing. Um, but uh, right now I say, I will say that uh, even, uh, we are even not at a stage where we have given a technology that and we have reached that threshold. We haven't hit the wall yet, but very soon that if when our technologies are developed, you are going to hit that wall. Uh, so the idea I would say is that, um, uh, you know, like um, develop few devices, show that it works, and then it can be, and show that it can be scaled up at this point. So innovation really happens based on demand and needs, right? You can see the coronavirus, the vaccine was done so quickly, becoming quickly, uh, because we had the need for it, right? Um, I, I think that once we come up with this technology and we say that, see, we have this capability for uh, recording from the whole brain at the at you know tremendous rate that we need non-invasively, then there would be a need in this community to develop you know technology uh, to get this um, data out and how to process it. So those will um, yeah happen based on uh, you know the requirement uh, that we uh, have at that time. But right now, basically, we are still not there. So we that the technology that can record at you know like hundreds of kilohertz rate uh, from even uh, you know I would say million neurons is not possible at present. So not to talk about 100 billion neurons that we have. Uh, so yeah, I would say even um, um, hundreds of thousands of neurons at the same time at that rate non-invasively is something we are kind of, we are going towards it and which we'll be able to record with our technology, like what is existing there. So I'm just hoping by the time we reach there, the other field will also catch up. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, for me, it's it's difficult to conceptualize that much data. Um, and I mean, the closest thing I can compare it to, I guess, would be financial data or maybe political data, where you just have these millions and millions of different data points. And then if you're looking at the activity of individual neurons, how can you get the emergent behavior of someone's feeling of self-awareness, uh, some kind of symptoms of depression, some kind of symptoms of Parkinson's. Um, and so looking at that much data, I think is kind of amazing to me. Uh, and I think it's a problem even with machine learning now. Yeah. Where mm -hmm. You have these, these massive networks that people don't understand the fundamentals of what's going on in each of them. It's just kind of this, this, HD, this HDFI file that people kind of throw at and then it, someone else loads it up and it's this magical black box. Oh, another thing I should say is that, uh, so machine learning, yeah, I think a lot of um, research is going on in uh, developing the software part of it. But uh, even if we have a great software, we do not have the hardware required, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, doing the computation that efficiently to, to actually implement that software of uh, machine learning, the hardware that is needed um, is, uh, is not available right now. And you are still using conventional electronics, which was not meant to do machine learning 
to do those kind of stuff. So it's not very efficient. We need like, you know, to get an algorithm done, we just need like hundreds of transistors. But actually, if we can think of novel devices, it could be done with just a non-conventional, just one non-conventional device, which is not a transistor, but can get an algorithm done. So if we really want to, you know, use AI and machine learning to this uh, kind of, you know, really hard, computationally expensive problems, again, we, we need to invest on the hardware as well. And uh, so I think that's also one of the reasons we are interested in still developing, going on to develop, you know, energy efficient computing devices and also learning from the brain and, uh, you know, uh, and then try to um, implement neuromorphic kind of systems. So that will help in the hardware. So we learn something from the brain and we can, um, you know, uh, uh, like include it in our hardware and, you know, make it more efficient. And then that can be used to understand the brain. So there's this uh, synergy, you know, interesting synergy going on between these fields. So this is actually a great segue to something else I wanted to talk about with, so you said in the beginning that a lot of this work actually stems from uh, new types of transistors and new types of electronics. And so the first thing that I would think of in a situation like that isn't going into neuroscience and switching over. It would be trying to produce new kinds of computers that would be more energy efficient, be smaller. Um, so how have you worked on, and you mentioned this a little bit, but what are your plans for scaling up this type of technology to be actually usable for something that's, I don't know, more like consumer friendly? So something like a, a microchip that could be used in a computer or a cell phone. Um, yeah, again, I, I would say the uh, field of neuromorphic computing, I would say still at a very nascent stage. It still needs to grow a lot. And um, uh, so what we are doing in our group is, uh, again, like um, uh, basically leveraging on our background in you know, new kinds of materials and novel device physics, trying to also the kind of things you have learned from the brain uh, to implement uh, those things in making new kinds of devices and seeing how energy efficient um, you know, uh, we can make uh, these devices. But I think the scaling up in the world of electronics is um, really done at the industry level. And it's um, um, uh, uh, something like, you know, uh, uh, say the um, uh, transistor or any kind of devices that in, we do in an academic lab. And when it really comes up, it's taken by, say, industry like Intel and all, and they develop like. Uh, like millions and millions of chips. So that's not something which we have capability to do, like in our MIT NanoFab. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the idea really is that, but on the other hand, industry really does not have, uh, you know, just uh, excellent, amazing students and postdocs and researchers like you guys. So uh, what we can do is, uh, what we can, how we can contribute is really come up with um, very novel, uh, you know, ideas and uh, and then uh, that then give it to industry to make you know many and many of them but we can give them that unique idea which can you know solve you know many of the problems and you can think of this finfets when it came up like UC Berkeley you know they developed the finfets they just showed one device uh, very energy efficient very good get control and then Intel took it over and you know produced uh, millions of millions of them and now they are integrated into our computer. Uh, so that's something uh, being in academia, we have this ability to contribute uh, and really novel, uh, you know, unique uh, ideas and devices. So I think uh, that's what we also plan to do. So uh, for the record, I do plan on going into industry after I get my, uh, my PhD. <laughs> so maybe my research output will go down. <laughs> <laughs> um, but on, on a more serious note, the, the kind of physicist in me needs, needs to ask about this. So um, your transistors work on quantum mechanical tunneling, which is a, a fun buzzword, meaning that like you have a, a probability density that will decay exponentially but not go to zero onto the other side. Um, and the main way that I've always heard it described is if you want to make sure nothing gets through on the other side, you make it wider. And if you want to have some higher probability density, you, you make it more narrow. So um, in a transistor type setting, I would think you would want to 
turn this ability on and off. So how do you kind of turn on and off quantum mechanical tunneling in these transistors? Yeah, the way we turn on and off, yeah, you are correct the, in terms of, you know, the barrier. Um, and there are two ways actually to uh, uh, reduce or increasing the probability. One is the barrier width, but you can also play with the barrier height. And uh, so the way you will uh, do it in a transistor. Sorry to interrupt, but uh, when you're saying the barrier width and height, are you talking about the physical barrier width and the physical barrier height? Is in like the so yeah, the barrier width is the physical barrier width. Barrier height would be because when you take tell about the barrier, it's actually an energy barrier. Okay. So it's not like a physical barrier uh, as such. So when I talk about the energy uh, barrier height, is the um, how to say it. So in, there are say, uh, in, in terms of electronics, we say that, you know, there are certain uh, bands, we tell conduction band, valence band. So the electrons, there are certain energy levels in which the electrons can stay and they can move around, but there are also forbidden gaps. So um, in terms of energy, it's not uh, say favorable for the electrons to be in those region. So those forbidden gaps, uh, you can engineer and make devices such that uh, to create an energy barrier with that forbidden gaps that ideally the electron doesn't want to stay in that region. So that is an energy barrier. And, uh, uh, and that energy barrier, uh, you can basically change, you know, uh, the width, but also if you change the energy barrier height, as it tunnels through that, that probability would uh, go down much more. Mm, and uh, how you will control that? So you will use basically a uh, gate voltage. So there is a source and a drain, and the electron is going from source and the drain. And there you put this energy barrier in between. Uh, but you also have a third terminal like gate. And uh, with this terminal, you can actually control this energy barrier. So in the off state, you want this barrier to be you know, large so that the probability is very low. And then in the on state, basically, you do device engineering so that it is extremely narrow. Uh, so you can uh, turn your device on, yeah. So do you raise and lower this energy barrier with a, with a voltage, or is it more complicated than that? Um, yeah, it is voltage, but you don't just raise the barrier. You also change the barrier width at the same time. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, so in addition to talking about these very small microelectron or nanoelectronic systems. Um, there's also been a lot of talk about kind of organic systems where like wet wires, uh, George Church's lab is famous for trying to integrate these things. Um, and uh, do you think these types of systems are going to be well integrated with a system like what you're proposing? Like, would it be easier to try and do this whole system in vitro and then do some kind of implantation or, or something along those lines? Yeah, that's something actually you are very interested in and you are already collaborating with a group in Harvard and, and the idea is to make, uh, you know, a hybrid uh, organoid with uh, nanoelectronic devices implanted in it. So you want to grow cells and grow cells with electronics in it and then grow it into an organoid and then implant it in an animal. So I think that's fascinating. We can actually integrate those two fields together, so it will have the advantages of both. So yeah, that's very exciting. Yeah, I've always thought those hybrid approaches are very interesting. Yeah. I've seen some papers of uh, organoids growing over some kind of electronic sieve, and I feel like having nano-electronic devices in the cells Already. is like a, another step forward of doing yeah. something like mm -hmm. that. Um, so in kind of the same vein, what would you argue is kind of the, the path of BMIs or uh, kind of nanobio as a whole? Do you think it's moving more towards organic interfaces, hybrid interfaces, uh, these nano interfaces that you're working on, or something more along the lines of using uh, brute force electrical work, kind of like uh, a Neuralink type interface? Oh, where it is moving towards or where we should move towards? Uh, so. <laughs> I, guess, I guess both. I think, I think both of those are really important. Yeah, I think I feel that, you know, the problems and the diseases are like so diverse. Probably, in my opinion, I think we should more um, move more towards a hybrid interface. It's probably not moving in that direction as much as it's going towards that brute force uh, electronics. We're still just trying to 
uh, increase the number of electrodes and uh, s um, but instead of taking any novel approach just we're trying to scale up um, that's what is um, probably industry is more interested in because that's I would say low risk lower risk because um, you know Utah IRA and all those electrodes have been there for a while it's easier to go in that direction uh, but I would think what would be more impactful is if we can uh, make this nano bio hybrid thing work that's more challenging that's relatively uncharted territories so it's risky um, but I think that's where the real, uh, you know, advantage may lie in the long term, yeah, in my opinion. So in looking at this, this long term, there's a lot of groups of people that kind of say that nature made us the best that it is, that we're ever supposed to be, that uh, essentially evolution has done a pretty good job already. Why are we messing with it? Why are we touching it? Um, and I know a lot of people in this field have a very strong uh, disagreement with that. And so I want to hear kind of your opinion and possibly rant on that idea. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we have to be limited by what nature has made us to be. I mean, that is why we are humans. I mean, animals have to be limited by what they are. They don't have the ability to change themselves but we have absolutely and i think we should absolutely do that but again coming to the point of you know augmentation and enhancement uh, as i said like we are just like uh, light years away from even solving uh, the problems of uh, neurological diseases and so many people are uh, suffering right now you know, we have so minimal understanding of the brain uh, if we think of it right now we just can measure like barely from thousand neurons the same time out of you know hundred billions that we have so we are so so far away uh, from uh, you know just and this basic understanding of our biology solving those diseases which you know so many people around the world are suffering from so I think the priority and focus uh, should still be uh, overcoming those challenges first uh, uh, but uh, there is no reason to say that, uh, you know, that if we are at a, say, I, I don't think we'll be ever be at a point that we have solved all diseases. If we have solved one, new diseases come in all the time. And uh, But at the same time, if we can think of enhancement and, uh, you know, augmentation, um, yeah, I see no reason to say that not to go in that direction. So we'll have to be very careful, though. I can see why people will be suspicious because uh, any any powerful technology that we think of, if we are not careful enough, can have very adverse effect. For example, yeah, we can genetically modify ourselves like today. The technology already exists, but uh, the thing is, what is the long-term effect, right? Um, in the short term, it might look that, oh, we changed this gene and we changed the characteristics of ours, but that is going to, you know, go over for generations. And uh, what does that mean for the world in the long term? So there needs to be a lot of discussion. There needs to be a lot of thinking in terms of what would be the long term effects before we, you know, go into that. So I think um, I can see why people would be skepti skeptical. And I think uh, it's absolutely fine to be doing so. And people who would be uh, working in those kind of areas like augmentation, they also have to be, you know, very, very careful, very, very responsible about uh, what they are doing and thinking of the long-term effects. And um, predicting long predicting long-term effects is also very difficult with these new technologies because we just do not know, you know, how much we'll be able to predict. And so I think we'll have to move very slowly in those direction like like make little changes and see what's happening and then uh, you know um uh, uh you know go in that direction so compared to where there are real needs where people are suffering and then definitely we need to come in and intervene and help people so i think uh, those uh, regions are very um like well defined what we have to do but the other region, uh, yeah, we have to be, I would say, like very, very careful. Yeah, I mean, I don't think anyone is going to argue against trying to help people that are sick. Um, so kind of a societal question. In this kind of ideal world where you see in movies where science just always works and it, it all comes together in the end, say um, you had 
produce this this perfect neural interface that was well integrated. Um, do you think society would be ready for this, or do you think it would go more towards a uh, dystopian kind of cyberpunk future, or kind of like a Gattaca future, where essentially it, it breeds more inequality, and you have this increased gap in people that have the interfaces versus don't have the interfaces, and that cause problems in uh, more societal ways that would be less obvious to the technology? You mean those interfaces which will be used for human augmentation and yes. enhancement? Well, the idea would really be to, you know, uh, make these devices accessible, you know, to more and more people. I think you can think of it like our cell phone, like smartphones, right? Initially, probably, you know, like decades ago, the, even a cost of a phone would be uh, too high. When I grew up as a child, I, I didn't have a phone, but now my nephews, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> like kids in kindergarten, yeah. they're probably playing, uh, you know, video game on a smartphone. I didn't even have a, you know, small, those, you know, very old archaic phones. Um, uh, till much later, till probably I was in college, you know, because, you know, you just have, you know, in a home wired phones, but cell phones were not that common. Uh, so at that point, uh, if people would have discussed, they would have thought, oh, if we had this smartphone, maybe the rich people will have access, poor people will not have access. I mean, that's still true. But we have made the cell phones accessible right now for, you know, many societal skills. And it is uh, helping. So the idea would uh, really be, you know, to make these devices as low cost, low, low cost as possible, as mass producible as possible, so that, um, uh, you know, and uh, so that everyone will have access. But at the end of the day, if I think of it, that if we, if we reach to that utopian world that we have cured all diseases, I think we should have cured poverty by <laughs> then also, right? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's so, you know, it should not be that oh, people would not have access. I think, um, yeah, I think we should probably work on, you know, eradicating po poverty uh, first. And, um, and, and that should happen if we had already solved the problem of all the diseases in the world. I think we are probably thinking of a much better world that point or at least the definition of poverty has changed like it, essentially like you could think of it comparing ourselves to someone in the middle ages right like the best richest king in all of england in 1200 didn't have the medical care of um, a person on welfare in the united states right now um, and so it's a, a changing of definition as technology advances and so you might have a, a disparity which is still a problem um, but you will also have things that everyone kind of moves up yeah exactly together. yeah, yeah. Um, so um you talked about when you were a, a little kid and, and i mean no one had cell phones when they were little kids even in even um younger people like me i didn't have a cell phone until i was probably in high school and um so i always thought it was interesting seeing how uh people have developed into becoming uh scientists and how their personal uh upbringing and like young life has developed their viewpoints and how they uh, see how that impacts their research field and kind of how they got to this point. Can you tell a little bit about your personal life and what life was like growing up and how did you ended up becoming a, an MIT uh, professor here? Oh yeah, so um, so I, I would say I come from a family who is um, like, which is not like very rich but uh, very unconventional, I would say, very unorthodox. Uh, for example, uh, at that point when I was growing up, uh, there is this general thinking that women do not generally go into, say, science and technology. It's like a very difficult field only for men. Uh, but uh, fortunately, my parents, uh, they, they never, uh, you know, like made me believe that I could not do anything. So I was always brought out to be brought up to be, you know, very strong and independent. Uh, so that is very convention uh, unconventional. Uh, so I think that helped me a lot to become, you know, strong and independent and pursue science and engineering as a field uh, of research, which is uh, not very common for women in India. It's very difficult, and I had uh, the support of my family all through. 
and uh, uh, my father actually um, you know he uh, he does uh, you know like a, a government job in a in an office but he has a very you know scientific mindset uh, so he used to do small projects at home so he made a washing machine which you can operate with your hand does not need electricity uh, but it's like uh, very easy he just uh, like designed the system with very small effort you can actually wash clothes uh, without electricity and several small uh, you know projects at home like to uh, like bring up heavy stuff uh, onto the roof of the house, you know, a system of pulleys which can do it very easily. So he was doing these scientific projects all around and I was very excited uh, to see those as a child. Uh, you know, the, the, the great, uh, I would say, the impact that science and technology, when you think of it, can uh, bring to your life. Uh, and then um, when, during my high school, I was... Um, say going through you know the science uh, uh, science books and projects and uh, just solving the problems and thinking about some uh, uh, something that you read up initially is not very clear but when you think about it more and more or is some other books the new concepts when they just uh, you know just blossom and becomes clear to you that was very exciting to me so that got me interested in science and technology and then I uh, pursued engineering for my bachelor's and uh, uh, very early on I had decided that I didn't want to go to industry <laughs> 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 because uh, independent research was uh, very important to me because I just didn't want someone to just come and tell me oh you just do this <laughs> uh, so you know uh, so either working in some kind of research lab, but that would also not be very independent. But being a professor, uh, you can, um, it's like, uh, you know, your own startup and that you can, advantages that compared to a startup, you can do like, you know, multiple projects and you are not worried too much about, you know, uh, the financial aspects of things that your startup needs to work or close down or the business point of things. So, th so that's the advantage of being in academia. So I always wanted to be in academia, you know, um, early on. I, I started research uh, quite early, almost like the second year of my bachelor's. Uh, and uh, there were not uh, as many facilities uh, as, you know, as they are here. Like I have never seen a nanofab when I was back in India. And uh, and uh, most of the things uh, that's, that I decided to focus on, because there were not many experimental facilities, mostly like uh, theoretical research and simulations, which you can do if you just have a computer with you. And uh, during my third year, actually, I went for an internship at Germany in Würzburg University. That's the first time I saw the nanofab, and I was like, oh, this is amazing. People <laughs> actually here make stuff and transistor, which we just read in books. So that was, uh, you know, such a great exposure. And uh, um, so I was still doing electronics engineering uh, as a bachelor's. Uh, so interestingly, I never liked biology. <laughs> uh, biology and chemistry were the subjects that I did not like at all uh, during my high school and, uh, you know, all my schooling because those are the things in uh, in the schools that there are a lot of things you have to read up and, uh, you know, just uh, learn by heart instead of, um, you know, uh, it, it didn't get the fun out of the subjects as, um, you know, as a school student, uh, so I had decided that oh, I am not definitely not going to pursue biology and um, be a medical doctor for sure. <laughs> so that that that's why I went into engineering and then electronics engineering and applied physics because they are very related. So that was why I chose that field. Uh, again, for my PhD also, it was electronics engineering, nanoelectronics. And it was only towards the end of my PhD that uh, actually I uh, developed a low power electronic device, but also showed that that can be also made into a highly sensitive biosensor. So that got me uh, interested in biology and I thought it was not bad after all, because when you go to, you know, in uh, like, um, like when you go to, you know, higher fields, like higher studies, then, um, then those subjects 
become interesting because you can contribute and uh, get the fun out of it compared to just learning by heart so a lot of things interestingly what you are doing now has a lot of chemistry um, because you have to functionalize the devices uh, biology of course you're not doing still not doing pure biology right now uh, we are still uh, very much rooted in applied physics and nanoelectronics and developing the devices with application in biology but um, still a lot of um, uh, interesting uh, biological uh, you know phenomena that we are uh, figuring out in terms of as i mentioned those how in the brain these biomolecules are aligned so those have never stopped to fascinate me so yeah so that's kind of you know the trajectory that i've taken I think it's kind of ironic that a, a man who created a washing machine that didn't need electricity had a daughter who went on to become an electronics engineer. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so what are some of the, the biggest challenges that you've had over, over your life? So um, you've explained parts of the trajectory, but um, if you feel comfortable sharing it, of course, if there are individual moments that were kind of like defining moments that said, okay, this is why I'm going to do this, or this is some challenge that I've overcome that has pushed me along in a certain direction. If you have a story like that that you might want to share. Yeah, I mean, there, there were, of course, a lot of challenges along the way. Yeah, but they were not, I would say, never so big that, you know, I fell down and I could never stand up. I mean, um yeah i don't know which ones were the main i would say main challenge if i say one of them is i never was very good when there was like a set exam with uh, say a particular fixed time say one or two hours and you have to perform very well i never did very well on those kind of exams when it was more when you have to think and do something uh, new um that's when i really did well and uh, specifically in India, you'll have to take a lot of tests and this kind of test where, you know, there is something you go in the exam hall, right, for one hour and then, then decides the uh, rest of your trajectory. Uh, so though I was very good in academia to start with, I think um, those exams I was not doing, like, extremely well. I, I mean, I still ended up going to IIT and all those places, but... Uh, there were not many opportunities, I would say, in terms of uh, doing research. When I was in India, it was very uh, difficult. There were no facilities uh, available, so it was a lot of um, reading up by myself, um, research fields, compared to what, say, is available here at MIT, like Europe's have this opportunity to work with, uh, you know, professors, and they have, like, world class facilities here you know, so so i think initially the progress would be not so great uh our exposure was not that good but i would say i'm not sure whether that's uh that was a bad thing or that was actually very helpful because that really helped me to you know think very independently i was just you know thinking very you know that helped me to basically think of new ideas and uh, theoretically I became like very strong by the time I came to US um, like the applied physics and uh, analytical skills those things developed the um, ability to work independently uh, that developed so I think there were challenges all through but um, that probably helped me instead of you know you just learn and grow all the while so yeah you have any kind of uh, work philosophy that has, has come about or has helped you become successful? Oh, yeah. My father uh, taught me as a child that, you know, work like a giant and live like a saint. Uh, <laughs> so that has become my work philosophy. But I have added another thing. I say, you know, work like a giant, live like a saint and have fun like a child. I think that has been uh, my philosophy. Yeah, so that's a, a good thing to add makes makes f working like a giant not seem so bad after all i guess um so uh you've seen a lot with different groups in different labs and all different parts of the world so uh are there any any work in any other lab that excites you um i know you have a lot of collaborators in all kinds of different fields um but is there any that really stick out to you like this is a really big changing discovery or some really interesting work 
Yeah, there's just so many lads <laughs> doing so many things. It might be unfair and biased. Okay. Just to point to one, I think. Okay. Um, so uh, for our last question, uh, we'd like to ask, are there any questions that I should have asked you but have not asked you? And what would the answer be? Oh, that's interesting. Hmm, not something I can think of because I think you asked, um, we covered like many different aspects and many interesting questions. Yeah. I think that's at the end of every MIT application. Is uh, is there anything else you should add if you're, you're looking at the application? Like, I don't, I don't know. I, mean, I, I guess, like, I guess I have to fill out this blank box. And, yeah. But um, yeah, thank you very much for talking with us today. Yeah, uh, thank this you. It's been great. Um, and uh, good luck with everything going in the yeah. future. Thank you thank very you. much. Yeah.